<laughs> Hello. Uh, so yes, as uh, Naomi said, uh, Catherine and I are here from uh, Arcadis, and uh, we wanted to share with you um, just some a brief overview of uh, a project that we've done, um, and it's uh, the end result is is community engagement, but it was, it was also a way to kind of think about how to use um, documentary research and uh, a, a way of of producing a uh, a digital piece of work where there wasn't too many restrictions on it. We wanted to throw everything that we could at it. So uh, I won't drag on anymore. I'll just start with um, a video that we produced that will um, just set the, uh, set the scene for it. I don't suppose you'll see anything much in the paper about this flight as it's being kept secret officially. Two thirds of the room is over country, which is mountainous, right to the water's edge, and a forced landing means a certain crash. French, Italians, and Greeks direct the entire route of courtesy for some time. We spent two days in forced landings due to federal troubles, but we flew 3,000 miles in three days. I have seldom, if ever, seen men work so earnestly with such perseverance, without which the flight would never have been accomplished. And uh, we're an engineering and design consultancy. Normally, we provide uh, archaeological and heritage guidance on development schemes. We have an internal charitable funding body uh, called the Love and Clan Foundation, which supports different community projects that Arcadis employees are involved in. Uh, part of this funding is run by a group called Local Sparks, and uh, they've uh, provided the funding with which uh, we were able to undertake this work. Um, so just how our entry point into into this uh, this project, I should have said the project is called England to Egypt in five days. Um, we provided master planning advice for Otterpool Park, which is a uh, proposed new town, which has just been granted plan uh, permission uh, in the area of Lim near Folkestone in Kent. Uh, this is a next generation garden town that is designed to support sustainable li living and a healthy economy. Uh, heritage has been a key focus of the design here, and uh, the client were open to having it form an important part of the master plan. So adjacent to this, um, I was conducting research uh, during COVID uh, on a 22-year-old Canadian pilot uh, in the RAF named Harry Yates. Uh, and in 1919, uh, in June of 1919, he broke the world speed record flying from England to Egypt uh, in five days. Uh, it's a remarkable story and has largely been unknown. It's only been published about once or twice in the past 40 years. Uh, and the, the story is uh, that he was sent by the Foreign Office in June of 1919 to transport uh, Harry St. John Philby, who's the father of Kim Philby, the uh, Cambridge Five uh, spy. Uh, who was only seven years old at the time, so he wasn't <laughs> notorious yet. Uh, he needed to ne negotiate a peace between warring tribes in the Middle East. In the Middle East, the aircraft they were going to take was a Handley Page 0400, which you've seen just in action now. They needed to fly over 3,000 miles in as quick a time as possible when international aerial travel was in its infancy. Uh, danger and difficulties plagued them every step of the way, and the aircraft failed uh, failed them more than once. Uh, one of the remarkable stages of the story was when they had to make a forced landing on uh, the coast of uh, the Greek mainland. 
Uh, they made an impossible landing in a riverbed, after which they were swarmed by Greek villagers who helped them repair the plane, feed them, and refresh them before they were able to take off again. Uh, the climax of the story takes place in Crete, uh, where they barely make their escape. And joining them on that leg of the journey was uh, T.E. Lawrence, or Lawrence of Arabia, who they rescued from being stranded there at a British aerodrome. Lawrence would later immortalize the flight in an unpub unpublished essay he would write, uh, which was his first work he wrote after completing the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. During the research process, I got access to Harry Yates's wartime effects when I opened up his logbook and discovered that the aerodrome he took off from was LIM, which was one of the heritage receptors that had been analyzed uh, during the assessment that Arcadis had undertaken. Uh, moreover, all the other reports uh, that had been done about Harry Yates mistakenly said that he'd taken off from London or another aerodrome uh, completely differently. So the fact that I identifying it was Lim was Arcadis' entry point in, into being able to tell this story. Uh, and uh, we wanted to use ArcGIS uh, Esri story maps to be able to, to tell that story. Um, the idea really was to create an immersive experience for the reader. Uh, none of these planes exist at all, um, and so it was very difficult to, uh, for someone to be able to just imagine what it was like accomplishing international travel at that time, let alone in a, a stretched canvas aircraft. Um, so story maps allowed us to host multiple, multiple media options, like the film that we opened with, the text of the story, which uh, tracks the letters he wrote during that time, the letters of the passenger, and also the military reports. Uh, we were able to use all of those to help color the story. Uh, we also wanted to host and display some of the actual data as well. Uh, the documentary research uh, that we used, handwritten journals, uh, these we, we brought in from Canada, from archives in Canada, Greece, uh, looking at newspaper uh, resources there, and then also a number of uh, colleges um, uh, in Oxford. And so the goal was really to create a digital product that could be accessed by anyone, anywhere, and that they would be able to understand how these planes worked and what it felt like to be inside and how difficult it was for these people to be on this journey. Uh, another thing that was great about it was we were able to layer in uh, real world experience. There's only two people alive that have even accomplished that journey now, about 30 years ago. You can find the documentary on National Geographic, but these two guys um, uh, rebuilt a, a Vickers Vimy, which is almost an identical plane, and they flew it um, all the way down from uh, England all the way to Egypt, and then they carried on. Um, and we were lucky enough to be able to interview uh, Lane Kidby, who was one of the pilots who accomplished that. And he, he re uh, relayed to us a very similar story to that riverbed story where the Greeks, the Greek villagers helped him out. So it was really great to be able to draw on experiential um, knowledge to color our primary sources. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague Catherine, who was a key part of this project, and she's going to tell you about some of the different tech that we used uh, to tell the story. Oh, yes, microphone, microphone. Thank you. Okay, um, upon uh, researching the story, we actually became aware of a reconstructed Handley Page cockpit, which is on display at Stowe Mary's Aerodrome, just outside Chelmsford. Um, this is the only cockpit or that you can see anywhere now of a Handley page, so we thought it was essential to visit this. So I was lucky enough to go down there and take a 360 camera and they very kindly let me place it in different areas around the cockpit and the pilot seat up on the front here with the gunner's position, even though the gun wouldn't have been in use when this plane was uh, being used for this journey. But we were able to get 360 images from different locations around the inside of the cockpit so you can get really, really clear immersive experience, you know, of what it would have been like to be in the various sections of this cockpit, because this is where the pilot and his crew would have been when they were making this journey in this fore part of the cockpit here. Um, we thought this was a, a key thing to include these, these immersive, this immersive imagery because we could implement it and use it in this um, story map. 
because we understand that not everybody could come and visit this example of this cockpit. You know, there's only one left and it happens to be in the southeast of southeast England. So using this in the story map really would make it more accessible to everybody. I think this was a, a key thing, using what we can, capturing as much raw data as we can for our own purposes so we can retell the story, but then also allowing other people to be able to enjoy it as well. Another sort of heavily data focused part of this um, research project was finding two of the landing sites on this journey. First, which first one I'm going to talk about is the Aegeo Revet landing. Adam just mentioned it where the local Greek villagers actually helped them during a um, forced landing. Trying to find this location was quite difficult because all we had to go off was the word Aegeo written here. That's all we had. So trying to find it was a little bit difficult to begin with. So. The first thing we did really was looking at aerial imagery, what aerial photography, aerial imagery can we use to try and track this down. We also found some writing that saying it was a sort of hillside location, so we had that to take into consideration. But apart from that, the only other thing we could go off is you need a riverbed that could accommodate a hundred foot wingspan of an aeroplane. So after looking at the riverbeds in the region, we actually found this one, which is just outside um, the settlement of Agio, and it could indeed actually accommodate a plane with a hundred foot wingspan. So after taking what we could into consideration, the size of the riverbed, the surrounding topography, the hillside, we think this is the most likely location of this forced riverbed landing. The second site that we had to find was the Suda Bay um, landing site, the, the um, aerodrome base where uh, Harry Yates and his crew met T. Lawrence. This one was slightly harder to find because, well, we started off with some aerial photography. Photographs taken out of planes at angles, they were black and white, they weren't very clear, the angle was off, it was a little bit distorted. So starting this, it was already quite a difficult task. Um, not only because some of the features in the photographs had now moved around between the two photographs, the landing tee in one in the second photo is already somewhere else that we were using. And the directional arrow, the north arrow was actually off that we found out later on. It would have been handy to know that earlier on, but we found out later. Um, we were lucky enough to come across another photo, actually. This time it wasn't an aerial photograph. It was a photograph from the hillside on the northern side of the Suda Bay region. This photograph was taken by an individual looking down onto the Suda Bay region. And you can see the aerodrome in the background. This was like a lovely little light bulb moment and we were able to completely reshift our focus away from the coast, which is near the naval base where we were previously looking, and now to the northern sort of Suda Bay region in the mountains. Um, some georeferencing, a bit of tweaking, took a little while to get it completely sort of as spot on as we could because as we're georeferencing an old, um, you know, aerial photograph, which is taken at an angle, it's the distortion, the changes to the landscape of which is quite a significant change at this point between the early 1900s and modern day aerial imagery. It took quite a while to triangulate this image, but eventually we managed to find the spot. And as you can see, the perimeter line, you can actually see some of it there is still in a, well, you can see the sort of the, the boundary to the, I think it's in highlight in red here. Yeah, you can see it there. Yeah, the perimeter to the Suda Bay aerodrome location is still actually present in the landscape. There's been some changes around it, but that perimeter line, as well as some other borders and field boundaries and um, other roads which are just off to the to right you can't see in the image really allowed us to align everything so now it's actually nice finally to to put that bit of the story together where Harriet would have met T Lawrence where where the I guess the climax of the story took place but finding the location then allows you to sort of make those connections between the people that were involved we've already spoken about Harry and T Lawrence but there's a lot of other people in the Suda Bay region that were involved in this story so not only are you filling in the blanks of story of these individuals, but now you can bring the whole Suda Bay region together and the communities that would have been involved in fighting this, uh, operating this airbase. So I'll hand back over to Adam. Sorry. It's only another half hour, so buckle up. Um, <clears throat> We were going to hold it, show the whole Lawrence of Arabia film, but at three and a half hours, nobody else would get a chance. Um, we completed the story map uh, in early 2023, and uh, we published it online. 
sharing it through many channels uh, before taking a week of direct community engagement. Uh, we set up a full week of lectures and engagement sessions with interest, different interest groups, uh, including our former client uh, 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 for the Otterpool Park development. Uh, so we were down in Kent uh, in that whole area there. Um, some of the locations included the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust, uh, the Lim Air Historic Society, and the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust. Uh, and we were lucky enough that one of the locations uh, was hosted in the church right beside where the aerodrome was. So it was fantastic to be able to bring this story all the way back home uh, to where it actually first started. Um, and I just have a few results there. Uh, the local community groups received us uh, very graciously and we're thrilled to have this forgotten part of their history brought back to them. It's really, it's, it's quite a famous area for the Battle of Britain connection, but this predates that by about 20 years. Uh, one of the things that the community groups said to us was that they couldn't believe that a consultancy, which is in the business of making money, was prepared to act as a type of public benefactor. Uh, and we're aiming to continue to build on the relationships that we've developed here by making, hopefully, making Lego displays, which will be used as exhibition pieces to help tell the story. Uh, and the client also said that they felt that the pilot should, at the, at the very least, have a street named after him. Uh, so we'll see how that all comes out. But uh, that was, yeah, that was one of the locations there, um, very nearby. Anyway, that's, that's all we've got for you. So thank you.